I'll go to back to blue actually. So I would usually just write UV, right, which looks like this: x squared on two log x to the n. Okay. However, this is a definite integral, right? So in fact, I should write this. Happy with that? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Okay. So then I've got my minus v du, right? Integral. Have a look. You've got uh, there's v there, and then there's du, which is okay. Let's let's just write this out. Okay. Now. We have to be so very careful, okay? There was something wrong with this question right at the beginning when I wrote it down. And hopefully, now that you look at this second line, something is kind of staring you in the face even more obviously, okay? What's wrong with this question? There's something really weird about it, yeah. Okay, so before you start doing any integration by parts or anything, you look at this and you say, hold on a second, hold on a second. This function here, is not defined there, yeah? It's not defined there. That's usually a bit of a problem for me, right? Because especially when you get to here, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa what? Okay, I, how am I supposed to evaluate this thing? Um, now, this sort of leads to a bigger question. Um, the, when it's, when we say, oh, it's not, <coughs> it's not defined there, okay? There are different ways that a function can be not defined, okay? Um, you could, for example, have a function, and you just arbitrarily say, oh, okay, I'm gonna put a hole there. I'm just gonna say, oh, I want it to find here and here, and so it's like a straight line, and it's got a hollow circle in the middle, okay? Then you've got asymptotes, you've got other kinds of things that create discontinuities, okay? Here's what I'm gonna tease for you, and I'm not gonna do the maths of it now, I've got two examples up my sleeve that, that demonstrate this. This discontinuity in this function as it happens, does not at all stop us from working out the bigger question. The bigger question is, what's the area defined between that curve and the x-axis, right? Because I'm integrating with respect to x along some x-boundaries, okay? Now, it seems a little bit counterintuitive that you could have, say, for example, um, I think one of the examples that we did was something like, um, I think it might have been sec x, possibly. Okay? So this is what we would call an unbounded region, okay? like this thing here, underneath the axis. Okay? But as it happens, mathematically there's no reason why you can't actually evaluate that area. That area, I mean, it does go on forever, but because of the way that it goes on forever, there is limiting behaviour that you can take advantage of. In the same way that if I talk about a half plus a quarter plus an eighth plus a sixteenth, that thing never ends. It's unbounded, but we know it's very well defined what that infinite series is equal to, yeah? Now you've got a similar kind of thing happening at the moment, okay? I'm not going to dig all the way into it, I'm just going to get enough of an answer to proceed from here, but if you're curious, like I said, I'll pull out my examples which will show you, no, there's no problem here, I'll even show you the picture of what this ends up being and that it is indeed well defined, okay? So, temporarily, look at this, don't weird out. Okay. Think about what this thing is going to be. It's a, it's a product, right? So if you're thinking about what this function looks like, if I gave, pose this to you as, like, a, say, a graphing problem, okay? Let's think about the boundaries one at a time. Let's look at the top boundary. Top boundary, okay? Um, you've got, that's going to be a half. What's this guy going to be? Zero. It's zero. <coughs> so the first thing I'm going to write is zero. And you think about the lower boundary. Now, we have this problem that we encounter, okay? Uh, which rigorously should be sort of sorted out with limits, okay? Because even though I can't get to there at zero, I can think about what happens. The limit as x approaches zero. Now think about that for a second. The limit as x approaches zero. What are these two things doing? One's approaching, One's approaching this guy's approaching zero, right? And this guy's approaching? Negative infinity, because like, you think about the log curve and it's sort of racing down, okay? Now, I won't, again, like I said, I'm not going to dig into the calculus, but if you actually go ahead and evaluate, it turns out you get to zero. It's a bit counterintuitive, okay? But again, I have the examples to sort of prove rigorously why. For now, stay with me and be content for the fact that this thing, it does actually, in fact, evaluate to zero. With limits. And I'll show you. I'll show you some examples. Okay. Wait, is that, is that like a famous 
It's a version of a famous proof. This particular one isn't, like this, this power is a bit arbitrary and that kind of thing. But there's a famous proof that's very, very similar to this. And all of the ones that we're talking about here, they're in this family of, of being unbounded, but being well-defined and finite. They are all part of this family of, of famous proofs. And I have a couple up my sleeve, okay? But I don't want them to cloud us here. Let's just take that for now and, and run with it, okay? What are we having in here? We need to sort of tidy this up a little bit, don't we? Yeah. And on to L. Okay, good. So I've got a, a constant there. M is a constant, so N on 2 is a constant. So if I pull that guy out, that deals with these two. And then in addition to that, I can actually cancel, cancel an X, right? Which leaves me with X, X log X, and minus 1 DX, which is exactly what I want. Exactly what I want. Because that guy there is I N minus 1. So, what was that result I was trying to prove before? I n equals... We're there. Okay, part one, done and dusted, out of the way. Okay, now, here, that, that in fact, apart from this like weird little discussion that we had, which I hope you can sort of hold your breath on, and we'll resolve later. Apart from that little weird bit, this is all pretty normal, isn't it? Like, we identified our u and our dv, this sort of came out, and this is usually where we stop. It's kind of where well, you have to stop because if it's indefinite, like what are you going to do? Give me a particular value of, of n or something like that, then I can work with that. Okay, yeah. So then you have to, then you have to put in the first bit. So <coughs> Which first bit? So the x squared on to ln x because you haven't um, fully um, you haven't fully put evaluated the integral yet. So it is probably better to leave it there so that you you're talking about this component here. Yeah, this component here. No, I don't. Because if you think about what this will become, how it changes as you climb down the ladder, it's always going to become this. Every single time. Every single time. Because think about what will be here, right? This, this integral from 0 to 1, and then you're going to have this guy, right? But every time you do it, that guy stays the same. He stays the same every time. It's this guy that changes, and then it keeps on being 0 all the way down. Right? That's the whole point of the recurrence relation. Okay. Um, one of the reasons I know I can be comfortable with this, because remember I said I'm mad at this question, is I machine tested it, so I know that's the actual thing, okay? All right, now, here's where it starts to get a, take, go in a different direction. Um, this is a recurrence relation, but there's an integral baked into it, and we sort of noticed this is a bit weird. You define an integral in terms of another integral, so it's kind of this circular definition. I want to get away from there, which is why part two says, if you haven't written it down already, write an expression for i of n, that does not contain any integral. And there's an integral right there, okay? So if you recall, the, I think the first example we started with, the very, very first one for recurrence relations, it might have been something like this. Do you remember this one? I think that was it, right? And then we looked at that, we actually evaluated it, we saw integration by parts happen twice, and then we thought, cool, now I can generalize. Now I can go power of n, and we did that, okay? But do you recall, at some point here as we were working through, right, we did integration by parts, then we did integration by parts again, and then you got down to some integral where you're like, oh, I can just work out what this integral is. And then it's like, cool, there are no more integrals left. I just have this answer down the bottom, and there's lots of x's and e to the x's, but it's done. All integration is finished. Okay? So I had to do two steps to do that. In this case, I'm going to have to do this n steps. So you're like, well, how long is this proof going to be? Okay. But because of the, the sort of the predictability of what a recurrence relation is, I can form a pattern and I actually I can do all n steps as I'm about to demonstrate.